Welcome to the shop. In today's video, I'm going to be making the base for this sculpture out of some laminated veneer that I cut from solid hardwood and then sand to get it flat, glue it together, and CNC machine the profile of the base on the CNC router. So let's get going. So I'm back in the wood shop now and I'm going to be cutting up some veneer slices to laminate together to make my three-layer base for this sculpture. I'm using some of the same wood that I used for the, uh, for the bent parts. I'm using birch and the mystery wood that I'm trying to remember what the name is, and walnut. So first thing to do is to cut some pieces to length. The piece, the final size piece that I'm making is going to be two and a half by five, but since it needs to go through the drum sander, and the drum sander kind of has a bit of a problem with, oh, okay, the drum sander has a bit of a problem with short pieces. So I'm going to cut enough material to make two pieces and there's a really good chance that I'm going to make more than one of these sculptures and so having some extra material is probably a good idea anyway, just in general. And as usual, I cut all of my blanks and my prep and my preliminary pieces always cut them a little too big. Yeah, it wastes a little material, but I never, I never end up in trouble getting too short and just missing by a fraction because I tried to, to save that extra fraction of an inch. And I head over to the table saw. I'm really glad I got a nice table saw. This is a, a high quality machine, very rigid, cuts aluminum really well, cuts really precisely. It's got a digital readout that you can't see in this shot of the video. So I can very quickly and accurately set up for the operation. And I'm going to be cutting the blank, like I said, going to be cutting the blank a little bit oversized because why not? So for a two and a half inch finished piece, I'm going to go to three inches. Typically in my metal working, I do anywhere from uh, 60 to 100 thousandths oversize on the blanks. On this, because it's getting glued together and there's going to be a bunch of other work involved, I get to make it a little bit more generous. For the birch, the only piece that I had in stock was eight quarter. I don't have any four quarter birch, but since I'm going to be cutting it down on the bandsaw, it'll be just fine. And going to cut a piece of MDF. When I'm gluing up the combination, when I'm gluing up this stack, I'm going to glue the whole thing onto a piece of MDF. And the piece of MDF is a kind of like a, 
a spacer to hold it in place on the CNC router, and then it'll be cut off after the piece is finished. I'm over on the bandsaw now, and I'm using a very heavy duty three quarter inch wide carbide tipped resaw blade to cut my veneer pieces. I'm cutting them a little oversized. The final size that I want is 120 thousandths, which is just a little bit less than an eighth of an inch. So I'm cutting them a sixteenth over so that I have some excess material to finish on the drum sander. Uh, but in the past, I've used regular bandsaw blades, regular thin steel bandsaw blades, half inch wide. But they tend to, and unless the thing, unless they're perfectly sharp and everything is set up perfectly, they kind of tend to get a little, a little wobbly, a little squirrely, and it's really difficult to get a nice parallel, precise uh, veneer blank. So this blade is stiff and heavy and sharp and should work exceptionally well. I have my machines on wheels so that I can use the space in the shop to park a car when I don't need the full air the full floor area for machines. So Now I'm going to be wheeling out the drum sander. I really like the drum sander for making my homemade veneer pieces. I've used it on some fairly ambitious projects, large-scale projects, and it's worked exceptionally well. It does absolutely require dust collection because without dust collection the sanding drum, you can see here that how the thing works, it's got sandpaper wound around a metal drum and without dust collection it'll just load up and pretty much start burning the wood almost immediately so I'm gonna go turn on the dust collector and then
machine does have a digital readout, but, and I use the digital readout when I'm doing more larger scale production, since this is a very small amount of work, I'm just kind of doing it a little bit by, by eye and by feel. precise work. It can actually do work within metalworking tolerance, within a few thousandths of an inch. So, still a bit oversized here. just absolutely beautifully. in it because it, it isn't held on that end. It's a single-ended uh, machine, so it does tend to flex a little. And to really get high accuracy, I have to put the piece through sometimes two or three times with the same setting.
getting very close to the final size here. before, as I get close to the final size, I put the pieces through two or three or four times with the same setting, and each time the flexibility of the machine is, uh, each time you put it through, it gets closer and closer and closer to the perfect dimension. So there's one, two, two, five, one, two, three, one, two, three. So the pieces are basically within thousands. Okay, this one is 0.12 dead nuts. This one is 0.123, it'll go through again. This one is 11.95, so it's uh, half a thou under. I'm not gonna complain. Woodworking to metalworking tolerances. Twelve oh five. I'm going to call that good enough. gluing up this assembly once again the first surface is just to hold it in place on the CNC router just to make it easy to hold in place so this doesn't need to be the world's most wonderful glue joint then And I'll make sure that I've got good coverage. And I trying to avoid getting glue all over my fingers, but I suspect that there will be no choice for the next step. And yes, this piece is too long, but oh well. When I'm doing lots of these, I actually have a a proper glue applicator roller but you know sometimes just quick and dirty is good enough I'm gonna make sure to get uniform coverage of the glue Don't want any 
any voids. So there's our stack up. And then put a little call on the top. And verify once again, yes, that is the correct order alignment that my design requires. So, throw on some clamps. And yeah, I do like the the Jorgensen clamps best of all. I've got a few of the the Harbor Freight version, and they kind of work, but they're just really, really poor quality overall. So, there we have it. Next step, off to the CNC router for profiling, off to the bridge port for drilling, then a little sanding, a little uh, conversion varnish uh, top coat, and this project is getting close to finished. It's been curing overnight, and Time to get the piece cut to a little bit closer size for the blank. So now we have the part that I'm making on the top and then the kind of fixturing part glued to it on the bottom. The edges even though they're, they're somewhat accurate, they were somewhat accurately glued, they still need to be cleaned up a little bit, so I'm going to go over to the table saw and then the chop saw and cut the blanks a little bit closer. They're going to be uh, 0.1 on side, so 0.2 larger. Uh, the part that I'm making is 2.5 by 5, so the blank will be 2.7 by 5.2. And that edge looks very nice and clean. So let's go over to the DRO set for 2.7 so the the glue line is looking really nice over to the chop saw And there we have it. The blank is 2.7 by 5.2. Ready to go. All the glue lines look really good. The wood looks really good. Everything looks ready to go. So now it's off to the CNC router. The first step in using the CNC router is to home the axes. Unlike the bridge port that requires the use of the Hymer, the CNC router has sensors on the axes that allow me to find a fairly precise zero position. So 
Let's perform the homing operation. And now, having said that, I'm going to check. I believe that my zero is not as good as I'd like it to be. The last piece that I made had a bit of a problem. So I'm going to recheck my zero. Because I have a, a very generous amount of clearance, I don't need to set up the Hymer and get the zero within thousandths. I made a custom user interface for the CNC router and at the time I made it I didn't believe that it was necessary to put in a manual g-code entry field and I kind of wish I did. Maybe one of these days I'll go back and take care of that. So just by the by the old eyeball I think things are looking pretty good. So the fixturing method that I use here, I've got a, an array of holes, uniformly spaced holes, drilled into my uh, one-inch piece of MDF. And then the one inch piece of MDF was surfaced on the CNC router with a inch and a half diameter facing cutter to make the uh, surface parallel to the XY travel of the machine. And then I've got this uh, hole pattern which was also drilled on the machine. So the holes are accurate in X and Y. I then have these pieces here that go into the holes and my zero is defined at that point so that goes to zero then I have these blocks that also go into the holes and then trying to find the the closest alignment of the block to the side of the part then I took some shing shim shingles these are tapered wooden pieces that are commonly used by carpenters to adjust things like uh, door frames and window frames and so the wood is thicker on one end and then it tapers down to the other end and I cut these guys into little pieces and by somewhat skillfully grabbing the right one, let me get a, some sort of a tool here, I can, it wasn't quite the right one. Let's go fishing around in the box until I find one that's that's close. So eventually, after a little bit of trial and error, I end up with a wedge action here that holds the piece pretty securely in place. I mean, it, uh, the forces that are applied 
during the, the woodworking operation are not that great. It's not like taking a heavy cut on a metalworking machine. So it doesn't have to be as serious of a clamp as it would for the metal machine. So always just a bit of a pain to fumble around through here and find the the piece that actually fits. There we go. But once everything is wedged in place, it actually holds really solidly. Let me show the, the detail of the wedging operation there. This it doesn't have automatic tool change. I have to change the tool manually. And I'm going to start out with a solid carbide. This is a downcut spiral that tends to force the material. If it does exert any force on the material, it tends to force the material downward, kind of into the clamp, and it doesn't tend to pull it out of the clamp. So this uh, device here is, this is a Z-axis zero finder. So when the tip of the tool hits the surface, it completes an electrical contact and lets the controller know that the zero position is a measured distance from this surface down to this surface. And so I have now defined zero as this corner and the top surface of the part. And like the bridge port, Uh, this control computer is also a Windows computer, which is on the network. So I can grab my toolpath program and so. Gonna jog over get the the tool in the approximate position and then once I push the start button things start to happen. And because this is the first time that I've run this program, I'm gonna be having my hand on the e-stop button and paying very careful attention because once the machine gets going it's going to do what it wants to do and sometimes it'll go bad before you can hit the e-stop even if your finger is on the e-stop so ready for some excitement And that is wrong. The, the machine has what's called work offsets. Um, the work offset for the fourth axis here, the zero is at this point. The work offset for this is over here. Um, I need to go to the toolpath program and set the correct work offset. Okay, I'm checking the G code to make sure that I have a G55, which is work offset two, and going to try it again. So, 
release the e-stop, reset the machine, see if it works any better this time. That's looking... Okay, so now comes an interesting philosophical question. Do I show my mistakes? And yes, I do show my mistakes. So here's what happened. Yes, I set the tool height, but I set it for fixture number one, for work offset number one, for the G54 work offset, and then mistakenly believed that the, the tool height would be correct for the G55. So, let's not make that mistake again. I'm going to rewind to the beginning, re-enable tool change, and see if I can do it right this time. And that's a good illustration of even if your finger is on the e-stop e button, as soon I mean as as soon as I saw that it was going bad, I pushed the button, but it still went fairly deep. Didn't quite crash the machine. Didn't ruin the part for sure, but it's something that. Uh, you got to be careful in CNC. CNC, especially the first time you run apart, stuff can go wrong. Much better. per minute. Quarter inch solid carbide down cut spiral tool bit. doesn't have automatic tool change, so I gotta go over here with the wrench. The next tool, the tool that's going to be cutting the more complex profile, is going to be a quarter inch round nose solid carbide. And of course, I need to re-measure the zero position, the tool tip zero. Okay, here we go. And it's looking very nice. I'm doing a 
spiral pattern and each step on the spiral is 20 thousandths. This produces a very smooth result that almost requires no sanding at all. Probably bump up the spindle speed a little bit. Actually, no, bump up the feed rate a little bit. Spindle speed is still the same. I bumped up the feed rate to 80 inches per minute because I'm taking such a tiny cut. The fixture is holding very, very well. I see no, no pull out, no looseness. This finish looks absolutely beautiful. And that concludes the CNC router operation. Let's get the part out of the fixture. So now I got the part looking pretty good here. There's a tiny little bit of roughness on one side but I'm sure that will sand out just fine and there's the fixture ready for the next operation so now it's off to the bridge port unlike my standard setup on the bridge port for most metalworking where I have the zero at this corner, the CNC router has the zero at this corner. So I'm going to put it in the vise and establish a different zero with the Heimer and then drill the two mounting holes. Setting the zero at you know, don't like having the the knee up high enough that it can break the Heimer, so we're putting the knee down a little bit. And 
manually doing the sanity check. Yes, in fact, it looks like zero. And then I'm going to be drilling the mounting holes, which are going to be 632 clearance holes. Load up the program. Set Z zero. does it for the mounting holes. So now, need to take this guy over to the bandsaw and remove it from its base. So once again, using the three-quarter inch resaw blade for this operation. So there it is. I left a, a little bit extra to have a little bit of room for finished sanding. So, it's off to the sander. Being very careful here, very, very gentle. This is a an 80 grit wheel or disc and I'm just barely barely touching almost no force at all I think I'll finish that one by hand. That's not... Okay. So, there's our part. Three layers. Nice little profile. And time for some hand sanding. Using some sandpaper on the welding table. Trying to avoid wrinkling up the sandpaper as pieces because it's so thin. It's a kind of a bit of a challenge to deal with. A piece of better piece of sandpaper here. on thicker pieces I can use the power sander to get the the bottom flat but as you could see in that failed attempt on the disc this piece is just so small that it's very nearly impossible to hold it either with hand sanding or with machine sanding, but at least with hand sanding get a little bit less out of control if it slips. So that there was just a paper-thin remnant 
of the attachment block on the bottom and the bandsaw pretty much got all of it so I'm there's very little that I have to remove in this operation and wow this thing is hard to grip but there we have it you know get the outside edge a little bit the CNC routing with the 20 thousandths depth of cut results in a surface that is so nice it's almost ready to go as is requires very little sanding so there we have There we have the base ready to go. I'll probably do a little bit more hand sanding before I paint it. It's going to be sprayed with uh, catalyzed conversion varnish and then, uh, then assembled and wow, this project is almost done. <laughs>